Superior Court for the Judicial District of Stanford for the transaction of criminal business is now open to the session. The Honorable Judge Randolph presiding. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning. Please be seated. Thank you. The court discussed with counsel this morning the final draft of the jury instructions, and that final draft with correction should be made to counsel uh, after the arguments today. Are we ready to proceed? Yes, sir. We can bring the jury in, please. Yes, Counsel, stipulate, please. Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. The court will explain how the proceeding will be scheduled today. Today is scheduled for closing arguments. Each side will have one hour to present their closing arguments. The state will have one hour. However, the state will have an opportunity to divide its argument into two parts. So the state will argue first, then the defense. The defense will have no second opportunity to argue, and the state may then uh, close its argument. Are the parties ready to proceed? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Attorney Manning. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I just want to start by saying thank you. Thank you for your time and attention over the past six weeks. I have an opportunity to speak to you now, and then the defense will go, and then Attorney McGinnis will speak with you one last time. Then our job is done, and yours begins. I'm going to start by talking about one thing that the evidence shows. Jennifer is dead. Let's be very clear. She was murdered on May 24th, 2019. There is blood spatter throughout the garage, throughout the undercarriage of two cars, footprints and swipes of blood. Her blood soaked shirt and bra thrown out in the garbage on the streets of Albany Avenue, along with zip ties, sponges, and duct tape. Make no mistake, this was a deliberate intentional murder. The evidence of Fotos Dulos taking his employee's car at 5.35 in the morning, driving down the parkway, secreting it at Waveney Park, and riding a bike to lay in wait for Jennifer. He did those acts because he planned to hurt, assault, to restrain her movements, and to kill her. Jennifer did not run away from her family, her friends, her five children, as the defense would like you to believe. She did not run away from her family, leaving her blood-soaked bra and shirt. She didn't hide in Waveney, head towards the train tracks. You heard the defense questions throughout the trial about that. Or try to make a call or get service with an old phone at Waveney Park in the afternoon on the 24th. The defense would have you believe she ran away from her kids, but she did not. Jennifer is dead, and Fotis and Michelle Traconis intended that to happen. They agreed to work together to make it happen, and unfortunately, they were successful in making it happen. But they got caught. This trial is very simple. It's about a conspiracy and about a cover-up. It's about Michelle Traconis' actions and about how she and Fotos Dulos conspired together to murder the woman who was standing in their way. 
It's about the frustration of Fotos Doulos not seeing his kids for over a year and a half, about having, well, not seeing his kids and having a supervisor present for a year and a half. And every time those kids came around, Michelle Traconis had to leave her home. She had to take her daughter somewhere else. And we know she was sick of it. The frustration turned to anger and hatred. Listen to her own words in the interviews. How she describes Jennifer, someone she has never met. She describes her as manipulating, angry, toxic. And we all remember the comment to Pavel, that bitch should be buried next to the dog. As you heard Mike Mean and Mike Rose's testimony, each attorney tried to tell her there's a light at the end of the tunnel because we know what she thought about the two years of the custody case, about the two years of court hearings. She described it as two years of torture, that it was a nightmare and that she was going to leave. But that light at the end of the tunnel, I submit to you, wasn't another court hearing because there was a court hearing and nothing changed. As of Wednesday, May 22nd, Fotos Dulo still had to have a supervisor present. Nothing changed. So they were gonna make it change. After all, why would they be toasting at a dinner party on May 23rd? If, why were they happy, excited, if nothing had changed? Because they were going to make it change the next morning. The defendant and Fotos Dulos conspired together to commit the crime of murder of Jennifer Dulos. That is count one. The elements that comprise the charge of murder are in agreement that the defendant specifically intended to agree with Fotos Dulos, and that agreement was to engage in conduct that, cons that constituted the crime of murder. That's intent to kill and do kill. That there was an overt act in furtherance of the conspiracy. Why did we spend so much time on Fotos Dulos the past six weeks? Because that's an overt act. And there's an intent requirement. The defendant had the intent to commit the crime of murder. So how do you know somebody's intentions? How do you know their motive? You look at what they do. You infer their motive, their intentions from their behavior. Look at what she did. Look at what Michelle Traponis did. Her acts, her behavior during the time of the murder. Look at what she did, her acts and behavior before and after the murder. Look at when she did these acts. Look at what she said. Look at what she didn't say. And look at what she lied about. Now the plan started on that Wednesday, May 22nd, when Fotos Dulos arrived an hour early. This is the person who Stefan Reich said had his own Fotos time. And then on Thursday, May 22nd, 2019, before the dinner party, remember when is important as well. Remember Pavel Gomini's testimony that Fotos Dulos told him he had to drop the car off at 80 Mountain Spring Road, the Toyota Tacoma, right? This, I submit to you, was, a, was in order for him to be able to leave early the next morning, and nobody would know. After drop-off, Fotos goes to the grocery store to get more meat. Do you remember that testimony? But what does he do while he's there? He sets up the alibi call. His good friend, Andreas Tucciardis, his good friend who coincidentally does not cooperate with the police. Why do you think he doesn't cooperate? Look at the timing, the text message that was set up. It was done at 5.53 after he had already moved the car. And it says, call me. The defendant, and Fotos Dulos have their dinner party. Hutch Haynes, his wife, the Reichs, there's a celebration, a toast to the light at the end of the tunnel. But they had already moved the car, and they had already set up the text message. So what were they toasting? Well, they were toasting what they were going to do the next morning. After the Reichs left and the Haynes left, what happened? The defendant and Fotos Dulos solidified their plan. At around 10 o'clock in the evening, they texted again. Fotos Dulos texted his good friend from Greece, to, specifying the time, 3.30 yours, which is 8.30 
and Connecticut time. <coughs> Just enough time for Michelle Traconis to drop her daughter off at school and return to Fort Jefferson Crossing to answer the call the next day. A call she knew what time it was coming. Is it just coincidence that she happened to be in the office at the exact moment that Photosulos told Andreas Tuchiardis to call him? Or is it reasonable, based on the motive and based on the evidence, that she knew what time that call was coming and she made sure to answer it? Now, early the next morning at 5.35 in the morning, Otis Doulis leaves 80 Mountain Road, and he drives to New Canaan and his employees to Toyota Tacoma with a bike in the back of the truck. And he leaves his phone with Michelle Traconis. This is all evidence of Photos Doulos and the defendant's intent to murder Jennifer. And that murder is the overt act in furtherance of the conspiracy. But Photos Doulos needed help to commit that murder. He needed an alibi. He needed the defendant. So what is the defendant doing while Fotis Dulos is driving down to New Canaan? When he's southbound on the Merritt Parkway at the Fairfield Rest Area at 636, or at the New Canaan Rest Area at 703? What about when he's riding a bike up Weed Street, the direct path between Waveney Park and 69 Wells Lane? Or at 7.57 when the school bus camera captures that Toyota Tacoma secreted in a cutout across from Waveney Park. Or at 8.05 when Jennifer returns home after dropping her children off the last time they will see their mother. What is the defendant doing while Jennifer is being assaulted and killed in the garage of 69 Wells Lane. Photos Doulis is a overt act. Remember, Michelle Traconis doesn't have to be at 69 Wells Lane. She is not charged with the murder. She is charged with conspiracy to commit the murder. It's Photos Doulos who committed that overt act. Remember Mark Davison's testimony? There were a minimum of two impacts. This wasn't a fall where she hit her head. You saw the blood splatter on the car, on the undercarriage of two cars, the garage floor, the garbage cans. You can make the reasonable inference that this was an anger-driven assault on Jennifer and she died as a result. Then there's the cover-up, the cleanup in the garage, the swipes, the paper towels that were missing <coughs> that Lauren Almeida put out the, next, the day before, the bucket that was missing from the garage. And don't forget the DNA on the faucet. Recall Matt Riley and Kristen Middell's testimony. Matt Riley took a swab off of that faucet because there was a blood-like stain that in his training experience he determined was evidentiary. And he took a swab from that blood-like stain and it contained Jennifer and Photostulos' DNA 4.3 times, 4.3 billion times more likely to occur. Recall Kristen Medell's testimony on that. Did that blood like stain? Well, let me ask you this. Did that blood like stain with Photostulos' DNA come from a cake two days before? Or is it more likely that he missed a spot? After he is done cleaning up the garage at 1025, Photos drives the suburban away from 69 Wells Lane. At 10.30, it's in the same direction en route back to Waveney Park, where it is later found by New Canaan PD with the battery dead in the car in reverse. Drives back the Merritt Parkway. Remember Trooper LeBeau's testimony? You make the call. It's your opinion, your memory that controls. But I submit to you, this is a bike in the back of his truck. And don't forget the Tour de France imprint on the tape that was found out of Harper. During this entire morning, Photos Doulos doesn't have his phone on him. Why wouldn't he want his phone on him? Well, there's two reasons. One, he doesn't want his location tracked. I think that's a reasonable inference you can make. But two, he needs somebody to manipulate it. 
He needs somebody to manipulate it at four Jefferson Crossing so it looks like he is home. So it looks like he's taking a shower. So it looks like he is in the office. So it looks like he is answering calls. We all know who that someone is. Michelle Traconis. Look at all the text messages that were not answered that morning and all the phone calls that were not answered except for one, the planned one. Make no mistake, she knew exactly what she was doing when she answered that phone. How do you know? It was planned, the timing, but also she doesn't talk about the call at all in her first two interviews. After all, the call is not on her alibi script and make no mistake, we call them timelines, but they are alibi scripts. That call is not on her alibi script. A lot of other calls are, but conveniently that one's not on it. It's on Fotis's. After all, it was supposed to be his alibi. Are all those things consistent with the defense's theory that she didn't know anything? I submit to you, they're consistent with one thing, her guilt. By the way, at 1025, when Fotos Dulos is driving Jennifer's Suburban to Waveney Park, Fotos' good friend, the one who called at 826, coincidentally, sends this meme. Choices. A, you can spend the rest of your life with your wife. <laughs> Why is he sending that meme at that time? Coincidence? Or does that just show the intent behind that 826 phone call? User manipulation. Mike Clark testified that when somebody manipulates the phone, they turn it, they unlock it, it gets recorded. Now, the only person who could have reasonably manipulated Fotis Dulos' phone that morning is Michelle Traconis. There is some evidence of Kent Mawinney. He came to the office at 721 and 841. But the phone was manipulated before 721, before he arrives, and it was manipulated after he leaves. The defendant is the only person who could have reasonably manipulated that phone and the only person who had reason to manipulate that phone. At 644, the phone is unlocked. 645, 646, it's turned. Orient orientation change, 701. 701, the phone is unlocked again. 807, unlocked again. All this while he is en route on the t in the Toyota Tacoma and on the bike and in the garage. At 8.26, she answers the call and puts it on speakerphone. At 8.31, it's unlocked again. And at 9.03, after Kent Mawinney leaves, it's unlocked again. This is the conspiracy. Now I wanna talk about the cover-up. There are multiple charges, but as I said, this is simple. It is all connected because the acts and behaviors of what she did what Michelle Traconis does before, during, after, and the statements, the omissions, and the lies are all what we call circumstantial evidence. And they're all circumstantial evidence for each and every charge. After all, you don't shake hands and plan to murder somebody at a dinner party. Look at the cleanup between 1222, when the Toyota Tacoma returns, and 710 prior to driving to Albany Avenue. These acts go hand in hand with counts one, two, and three. The Toyota returns at 1222, and then the defendant and Photos Dulos both go to 80 Mountain Spring at approximately 135. And from 135 until 458, when Pavel Gomini shows up, Photos Dulos never leaves 80 Mountain Spring Road. For three and a half hours, he never leaves an empty property. It is reasonable to assume that he needs that amount of time to clean the Tacoma and to prepare the garbage bags for Hartford. Michelle Tracona submits in her own interviews that she went back and forth to 80 Mountain from Fort Jefferson Crossing that afternoon, but she says she only did it two to three times, depending on which interview you watch. But look at her interviews. She omits 
and lies about things only when they're incriminating. There were five trips that day, not two to three. Trip one, 136 to 141. She stays at 80 Mountain Spring Road for five minutes before returning to Fort Jefferson Crossing. Trip number two, 201 to 224. She returns to 80 Mountain Road, stays for 23 minutes before returning to Fort Jefferson Crossing. And trip number three, at 355 to 404, she stays for nine minutes. What is she doing between trips two and three? Between 224 and 355 when she is alone at Fort Jefferson Crossing? She's burning something. Then she's not burning something. And then she's burning something again. Remember, there were three separate fire events, ladies and gentlemen, this is two of them. And she is alone at Fort Jefferson Crossing while the fire is going on. How do we know that she's alone? We don't see any other cars leave 80 Mountain Spring Road. Her own admission in her interviews for driving the Jeep in the Suburban and Photos Dulles' phone location. Mike Clark's testimony, it stays at 80 Mountain Spring Road during the time of those fires. Now we go to trip four. Michelle Traconis goes back to 80 Mountain Road. She stays for 35 minutes between 423 and 458 when Pavel Gomini shows up. Then Pavel Gomini leaves, Michelle Traconis backs out of the driveway and photos duos leave. They all leave together. And at this moment, she takes the keys to the Toyota Tacoma to prevent Pavel from taking the car for the weekend. After all, they need more time. They haven't gone to the car wash yet. Look at her alibi script. Look at her interviews about what she says and doesn't say about the keys. But Pavel's insistent he wants his truck for the weekend. He wants that motorbike. So she has to return the keys. And she stays for four minutes to return the keys. And she goes back to Fort Jefferson Crossing and we have a fire event. These acts, including her statements, are all circumstantial evidence of her agreement to conspire with Photos Dulos to murder Jennifer and to tamper with evidence and being an accessory to tampering with evidence. When I talk about tampering, I'm going to combine <coughs> counts two, three, four, and five. Counts two and three have to do with May 24th and the events at Albany Avenue and counts four and five have to do with the Tacoma and Russell Speeders on May 29th. The elements the state has to prove for conspiracy to commit tampering is the agreement and agreement with Fotos Dulos to commit the crime of tampering. Tampering itself is knowing a criminal investigation is pending and I submit to you that it is a reasonable inference a criminal investigation is going to, going to commence when you commit a crime like murder. And that evidence was tampered with. In counts two and three, that is very simple. That's all the items that came out of Albany Avenue. Jennifer's bra, her shirt, the zip ties. And for counts three, four and five, that's the Toyota Tacoma. There has to be an intent to deceive and there is a clear intent to deceive, to destroy evidence when you throw it in a garbage can on Albany Avenue, or when you take the vehicle you use to commit the crime to a car wash and ask for two extra details on the interior. The overt act, well, here, straightforward, the defendant traveled with photos duos to Hartford to dispose of the evidence and you specifically intend to enter that agreement and commit the crime of tampering. She's also charged with being an accessory to tampering. Accessory requires simply that you intentionally aid Fotis Dulos in tampering with the evidence. This is both for Hartford and Russell Speeders. And what did the defendant and Fotis Dulos do next? It's all very clear. It's on video as C4. Please watch the C4 videos again. I'm not giving enough time to show them to you. 
uh, but I am going to draw your attention to one of those videos, specifically the Albany and Blue Hills camera. It's also on Adams Street at around 748. When you watch this video, notice the simultaneous actions of Photos Dulos and Michelle Draconis. The coordination that after they have been sitting there a while, they open the door at the exact same time. Conveniently, at the right time to block the view from the tan car waiting to exit the parking lot. After we all, after, after all, we know what's in that sewer. It's the license plates, the altered license plates. And it is reasonable to assume that the defendant, Michelle Traconis, did not want anyone from that tan car to see what, what they were doing. They didn't want a witness. What does she do next? At this exact moment, she opens her door. Well, she says it in her interviews. She wipes gum off of her hands onto the city sidewalk. Is that reasonable? Or is it more reasonable that they didn't want anybody in the tan car to see photos to dispose of those altered license plates in the sewer? Coordination, conspiracy, and intentionally aiding. After all, who uses a city sidewalk to wipe their hands? As for the evidence that was tampered with, you have them. The license plate, the bloody ponchos, the gloves, the tool, the bloody towel, the mop, the zip ties that were cut, and her shirt and her bra sliced down the middle. Don't forget the bag, the bag that contained the defendant's DNA on the opening. That bag also contained blood-like stains and duct tape. And that duct tape had Jennifer's DNA on the sticky side of it. That, the defendant's DNA on that bag shows her knowledge and her lies. It proves she's an accessory to tampering. Now the defendant would have you believe she knew nothing of photos Dulos' acts but look at the context. The police knock on her door that night, May 24th, 2019, when her daughter is not home. The police want to talk about her boyfriend being missing and they are, her boyfriend's wife being missing. And they are in the middle of a contentious divorce and custody battle. If she were, if she didn't know anything, why would she hide in the bedroom? She wasn't hiding from the police that night. She was hiding from the truth. Is it more reasonable the next day at the hairdresser when she was happy and excited, that she was happy and excited because she thought for a brief moment they got away with it? Or is it, well, then what happens? Photos Julius's phone gets taken. He can't get the kids that weekend. The plans, they set in place, they start to crumble. She knew what was going on, ladies and gentlemen. Do you remember her joke in the interview? She made a joke about the fact that she said maybe she can have sex with Fotis while she's in jail or he's in jail. Watch the interviews again. Now, this is all before May 29th, before Russell Speeders. And this is the last count hindering prosecution where the state must prove, and we have proven, that she provided assistance to Fotis Dulos with intent to prevent, hinder, and delay and discover the crime the charge of murder. She assisted by providing transportation to him and other means. This is all about the Toyota Tacoma. Remember Pavel's testimony, how he hasn't spoken to Jennifer Dulos in years, and yet her DNA was on a blood-like stain that Matt Riley found on the seats. <clears throat> And remember Kristen Medell's testimony on how easily DNA can be destroyed with just wiping, let alone the cleaning solutions that they use at Russell Speeders. The defendant provided assistance and aid to Photos Dulos on May 29, 2019. She followed him to Russell Speeders that day in her rented Yukon. Photos Dulos put down her phone number and they left the car wash together. The defendant got the call that the car was ready and she went back and went to the bank with him to pick up cash to pay for it. And she was with him to pick up the car. 
The evidence proves beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant intended to end her and Photos Doulos' two years of torture by murdering Jennifer Farber Doulos. She acted as his alibi during the murder. She conspired to tamper with the physical evidence of the murder, intentionally aided in covering it up at 80 Mountain Spring Road, at Albany Avenue in Hartford, and at Russell Speeders in Avon. The evidence shows the defendant is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of each and every count. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is the one and only time, except during voir dire, that I get to speak to you during this trial. It's been a long trial, and I will just echo what Ms. Manning said about your dedication and your uh, attention to this case over what has been, at least in recent years, one of the longer trials that has taken place in the state of Connecticut. I am going to um, refer to notes while I'm talking. Usually I just try to talk and I have pointers, but because there are so many things that happened in this case, there's just been so much over the course of the last six, six and a half weeks. I may refer more to the notes than I normally would, and I apologize in advance if it looks like I'm reading from uh, a paper rather than just talking to you. What I want to start off by pointing out is that what really happened on May 24th, 2019, because whatever was going on that day, whatever Fotis Doulos' role was, in the disappearance, and we'll, I'll say the likely death of, of Jennifer Dulos, Michelle Traconis did not know. She did not know that Fotis Dulos planned to harm her. Everything suggested that things were going well, and it was to the contrary. In fact, she didn't know that Fotis was capable of doing something like this. A man who was dedicated to his five children, had been in court for years trying to get custody back. The state has made what I would suggest are unfounded and unfair assumptions and has speculated that Michelle Traconis had to know what was going on, that she was, because she was romantically linked with Fotis, that she was somehow involved in this nefarious, murderous plot. But, but that's not reality. That's more like one of these cable TV movies, scripted movies. It's not based on the facts that you heard during this trial. It is, and I will say this multiple times, speculation. It's conjecture. It's guesswork, which is not the standard of evidence in a criminal case here. We also concede that something bad did in fact happen at 69 Wells Lane in New Canaan that morning. It's clear, and we will also concede, that Fotis Doulos is ultimately responsible for what happened to Jennifer Doulos, whether he did it himself or he had a compatriot who was involved in it down there. Because 
we know someone else was down at 16, or at least down in New Canaan that day, and we know that wasn't Michelle Traconis. The state has not proven where Fotis Doulos was that morning. There are some suggestions. We see the vehicles driving. There is a tiny amount, I emphasize a tiny amount of DNA found on a faucet inside the home, which I'll talk about in a minute. But whether or not Fotis was in Farmington, whether it's in New Canaan or somewhere in between, it is conjecture as to where he actually was and what he personally did with his own hands. Now, we're looking at evidence that's been going on for five years, collection of evidence, and taking statements as recently as last month from Mr. Gumieni, new statements from Mr. Gumieni. But there's been forensics, there was surveillance cameras, there were multiple interviews, there were family court pleadings, there were the interrogations, you heard eight, nine hours of interrogations of Michelle Traconis. Even in hindsight, even now, major questions remain about what happened. And it's still unclear. It's still unclear what happened. And unfortunately, this trial will not solve that puzzle. It will remain a mystery, an unfinished puzzle. But again, this is not Fotis Doulos's trial. This is Michelle Traconis's trial. And because it's Michelle Traconis' trial, you must find beyond a reasonable doubt that Michelle conspired with Fotis Doulos, not just to cause harm to, to Jennifer Doulos, but to murder her. That that was the plot, that was the intent of Michelle Traconis on or before May 24th, 2019. Then you have to find beyond a reasonable doubt various elements that Michelle was part of a plot to get rid of evidence, some microscopic, some in opaque garbage uh, bags, but that she knew what was in it, knew its purpose, and what she did was, in, was the same exact intent as whatever Fotis Doulos had planned. But again, Part of what you have to prove here, and what the state has to prove, what you have to find, is that Fotis Doulos murdered his wife. The criminal information, which you will have, states specifically that Fotis Doulos assaulted his wife and restrained her and intended to kill her. Again, there's no evidence of that. It's speculation as to who actually did that, as to any of that, to be, for that matter. No matter how you view this evidence, even in hindsight, five years later, there is nothing to suggest that Michelle had any clue about what was going to happen in New Canaan on May 24th, 2019. More importantly, there is nothing to suggest that Michelle would even think that Fotis was capable of doing anything like that. Again, Michelle simply did not know. Now, we can talk about what, family, what Michelle did know about Fotis Doulos. We can talk about his life before June 2nd, 2019, when Michelle was uh, after her arrest and being brought before the uh, police and being interrogated for that first time. This is the Fotis Doulos that Michelle had met down in Miami. It was very different than the one that the police were describing to him and what the police had learned from Jennifer's family and what they knew about Fotis Doulos. Michelle met Fotis in 2016 at the Miami Water Skiing Club. Both were members, both were competitive water skiers. They both had children about the same age and the children became friends. You heard from Lauren Almeida about that. He introduced, Fotis introduced the babysitter he introduced his children. And at some point, Michelle fell in love with that man. He was an outgoing, fun-loving father, successful businessman with a high-end construction of homes business, a competitive athlete with similar interests to her. Obviously more similar interests than has been testified to that um, Jennifer Dulos had with photos. 
But she was also told, and you heard this from many people, that they were working towards an amicable, friendly divorce, that everything was going to be fine, there was going to be legal separation and an amicable divorce and custody. In September of 2017, Michelle did move to Connecticut with her young daughter. She enrolled her daughter in local schools, made her own friends, engaged in her, in her passion for water skiing. She traveled. She helped work on her daughter's athletic interests and her sports training. But more importantly, she also had her own business. You heard from several people she had an import rug business that she was selling in, in local um, Farmington Valley stores and to individuals. But Fotis always showed the side of him that he wanted her and others to see. He hid things from Michelle just like he did from his friends and from his employees, including Pavel Gumieni. He did that for years. Even Lauren Almeida, the, who used to work for him, who considered him a mentor, didn't believe it when Jennifer suggested her that Fotis was having an affair. He was good at hiding what he was really up to. Now in 2019, and we just heard that from the prosecution, there were some strains in the relationship between Fotis and Michelle. Just like Fotis, you heard, was lying to her. He was storing other women's phone numbers in his phone. He would put some of those names in, in the Greek language, which she didn't understand. And she was upset, thinking that he was communicating with other women, but using men's names to, to hide that fact. They were written in Greek, and, there's, and Michelle didn't know any Greek. She had already talked about moving to Colorado with her daughter after the end of the school year. And it also looked like at the end of April, the custody fight was about to end. It was a favorable report. Everyone said that report was favorable to Fotis Doulos, and that he was going to look forward to spending the whole summer with his children. That was discussed not just uh, with the lawyers who talked to Michelle, but it was also discussed with his friends and those that knew him well. They were, quote, moving in a positive direction, unquote, at starting at the end of April. And according to Michelle's interviews with the police, she also thought everything seemed good by May. Everything was consistent with the testimony by friends, his coworkers, his employees and former employees, and especially the lawyers that you heard from, Mr. Meehan and Mr. Rose. This nefarious plot under those circumstances makes no sense. Why then? Why at that moment is he going to then plot with his girlfriend to, to kill Jennifer? Even in hindsight, that doesn't make sense to any of the people that you heard from. None of them. Let's talk a little bit about um, Pavel Gumieni. His name came up but very briefly in the state's argument. Mr. Gumieni saw photos every day, practically, during the week for years, for many, for a decade even before he worked for him. He came into that business, worked with him, talked to him, knew and liked Jennifer Dulos, helped her move down to Fairfield County without Fotis knowing it. He didn't want to upset Fotis, so he was actually helping Jennifer move her belongings out of the house without uh, tipping off Fotis that she was doing that. But what else about, what else do we know about Pavel? Even after Fotis Doulis was seen or believed to be cleaning his Tacoma, he had told Michelle that Pavel intended to sell it, and he told Pavel to find a replacement for it. He also told him to replace the car seats in that Tacoma. Remember, Pavel Gumieni was combing junkyards up in the, uh, between Waterbury and, and Hartford looking for new seats. Fotis told him to call seats, if he called him on the phone, hardware. What is this, some kind of spy code? Why would Fotis tell Mr. Gumieni to not refer to it as seats, but hardware? 
who would be present at that point? Michelle or perhaps other employees? He didn't want them to know. Then you saw the picture. He took the Porsche seats, took them out of the uh, Porsche, put them in his vehicle, but in such a haphazard way. You saw that picture. They're, they're being propped up with a bucket. He's driving now his Tacoma with a bucket holding a sports car seat in his pickup truck. Despite all these red flags, doing all these things, after Fotis told him he wants him to do this because there may be some of DNA of, Mich of Jennifer in his vehicle, he does it anyway, even with full immunity from prosecution which the judge will talk to you about, he still insisted to you in questioning that he did not believe that Fotis would harm Jennifer. Even after, as long as a reasonable explanation was given to him as to why he should do these things, he believed that. And he went along with it. He knew more than Michelle did, and he still did his bidding. There are those people that came to the house the night before, May 23rd, 2019. You have Stefan and Beth Wright, you have Hutch Haynes. All of them talked about what a wonderful evening, happy evening it was. They talked about there was no bad mouthing of Jennifer at all. If you remember, Beth Wright, who is a domestic violence counselor, that's part of her job, it's one of her jobs, went so far as to say that they that everything seemed to make sense, everything was working out. They basically toasted the happy outcome that it was going to end very soon in a happy way. Hutch Haynes, who had known Fotis for years, for years, didn't think he could do anything like this. You heard that from him. That was even during the investigation, even after the police came and they had divers going through his water skiing pond. I already talked about what the babysitter, Ms. Almeida, said. They thought Michelle, she thought Michelle was nice. And there are also, even through her, no prior, no prior examples or incidents of violence. There was a discussion about him wanting her to sign a piece of paper, yelling at her, but there was never any violence in that relationship. The professionals, attorney me and the guardian ad litem, the social worker, Sidney Streeter, they both were involved, Meehan was involved for years. He also said everything seemed to be working out. It was a favorable report. And Ms. Streeter, a professional whose job it was to keep an eye on Fotis Doulos, described how amicable and friendly that was on the Wednesday, I guess naming day for the one of the one of the daughters, where they were talking together, they were being civil. He gave her a chocolate bunny, and she took it from him and ate it. He handed her a cake. She took that and brought it into the house. She invited him to come out and sit out on the picnic table and have dinner with the children since the park closed earlier. You heard attorney Mike Rose, the divorce lawyer for Fotis Dulos, say that Fotis was keeping, didn't want to talk about the divorce case in front of Michelle. Said, please call me later. I'm sorry I can't talk while Michelle is around. But he also, he's the one who said, there was now light at the end of the tunnel. Everything was going to be fine. Things were looking good. Why at that moment would Michelle agree to risk her life, risk her daughter's entire family life to at that point say, I think we now want to get rid of Jennifer Dulos. It doesn't make sense. It's pure speculation. You heard a little bit about Anna Curry during the questioning of Mr. Kimball. You remember Anna Curry was, was uh, the woman who moved in with Fotis Dulos right after she had moved out and had been arrested. Her picture was shown to Michelle. And you remember, I can't remember if it was Clabby or Kimball referred to her as Michelle 2.0, do you remember that? That was a woman who had moved in, moved in with this man within a month or so of him being accused of destroying evidence on Albany Avenue with bloody shirt and a bloody bra 
connected to uh, Jennifer Dulos at that point. Then you heard, remember, from Petu Dupera, Clara. She was a friend of both Michelle and Fotis, had been to the house many, many times. She never suspected that Fotis would harm, his, harm Jennifer, not even after June 1st, 2019, when she never spoke to him again. She did speak to Michelle. She continues to speak to Michelle. She's here in the courtroom even today. Let me just talk in general about something that I think that maybe we can all agree on. The people that we trust and believe in are our friends and loved ones. And people usually are who they say they are. We don't immediately go and distrust them, even when certain red flags arise. Even if you think they're doing something, I wonder why he's doing that. You don't suddenly think this is a bad person. Our default in our, in our human interrelations is to believe people. We all do that. We also never think that we're going to be manipulated by someone we care about. This could never happen to us. But with the benefit of hindsight, we can't even believe that we were fooled and tricked in that way. I believe I asked most of you during voir dire if you think that you need to share everything that you're thinking and doing with your significant other or spouse. All of you at least acknowledge that they should do that, but I also recall saying that you don't believe that they always do. But that doesn't mean we stop caring about that person. It doesn't mean we immediately decide they're what? About to murder somebody? That's not how we think. We also know that Fotis Dulos committed suicide in early in 2020. You have that death certificate in evidence. You can see he died from the complications of acute carbon monoxide intoxication. It specifically says intentional inhalation of motor vehicle exhaust inside a garage, and you'll see the yellow box, suicide is checked. Whatever Fotis Dulos did, it was not for or because of Michelle, and it was not with her. Fotis put up a facade until his last poisoned breath, and he died without ever acknowledging his actions or admitting his role even to his own children. He never gave answers, and he can't be held to answer. Everyone wants closure. Michelle is not the remaining half of a scheming plot. She was never part of the equation. That is pure speculation. She didn't know. Most of this trial has been about Fotis Dulos in absentia. You heard about the, the, the fingerprints. You heard about the uh, blood. You heard about the DNA. You also remember that the biologist Anna Valonis said that these KM tests, these so-called screening tests, they only suggest the possibility of human blood. It's a place for them to swamp. And the suggestion by the prosecutor that, well, there's some DNA on the faucet, and we should assume that means that Fotis Dulos was in the house. It was, remember, it was a mixture between Jennifer Dulos's DNA and Fotis Dulos's DNA. It's the only place in the house. Why would his DNA be there other than she took chocolate from him, she took a cake from him, the children all had touched his hair. They were playing basketball with him. And where else would they wash their hands before dinner but on the faucet in the kitchen? So a small amount of DNA appeared there, and it just stays there. It doesn't go away. In the same way, you heard Mr. Gumieni admit that Jennifer Dulles had been in his truck before. You want to know how a tiny bit of DNA gets? Remember, on the underside, not on the seat, but on the underside, it's because Someone had sat in that seat. It was not blood. Those were sponge rubber seats. The state is asking you to speculate that there is evidence where there is none. But the absence of evidence, the absence of evidence is not evidence. You can't infer facts in a vacuum. Zero times zero equals zero, basic math. You wonder, how much blood would have been there 
If only uh, Fotis had not taken out a car mat that was never found in the suburban, how much blood would have been in the Tacoma if it hadn't been brought to the car wash? How come there was nothing in the Cherokee that maybe Michelle was driving and not uh, Mr. Gumieni? There was nothing in the Cherokee because there was nothing to find in the Cherokee. What might have been discovered at 80 Mountain Spring Road if Michelle and Fotis hadn't done a little cleanup for a showing that we have proven happened the next day of that house? Let's speculate. The state would have you speculate about a smoke coming out of a chimney in the fireplace in the house. Unfortunately, it's in black and white. The original is in color, but that's the best we could do for today. You were shown a couple of videos. Two of them are within minutes of each other. Remember, that is a, that's a motion-activated camera. So, so to suggest there were just two times when there's smoke coming out of that chimney is unreasonable. It's unfair, and it's misleading in many ways. Police continue to investigate. They continue to assemble evidence. We, we, they went to Albany Avenue after learning that Mr. Dulos's phone had pinged on a cell tower on Albany Avenue, and they got the C4 cameras that showed him, not Michelle, putting garbage in black, opaque bags in various receptacles, three receptacles, not six, not 30. Now, the state is asking you to evaluate in hindsight that she must have known what was in those bags. They were on Albany Avenue. They, she had told her they were going to Starbucks, but they went past Starbucks. Now, I believe the map show it's about one and a half miles past where the Starbucks is. But he told her, well, I just have to get rid of a few bags here. She told the police that he had done that before. Contractors, think about it, when you build a spec house, you heard that from Mr. Wright. You build this house, you hope, hope to sell it. It's not for a particular customer. But if you have to buy another dumpster, if you have to rent another dumpster, that comes right off the profit. It comes right off the bottom line. So how many builders drive around and go to public locations and dump trash in, in receptacles that aren't their own? Especially since Friday morning, you already now know, was garbage pickup in that part of Farmington. But what do we, knew, what do we know today that we didn't know then? We know that Jennifer Dulos missed her appointment with a Dr. Geronimus that morning. We know that she was supposed to be in New York, that her children and the babysitter had already gone to New York. The call came in at 7 p.m. to the New Canaan Police Department that Jennifer was missing. They went to the house. They noticed something that looked like blood, and that's when the investigation began. Teams of investigators from multiple agencies took part in this investigation. They went through every point and every part of the garage at 69 Wells Lane. They found obvious signs of, a, of violence and they're working against the clock. Now at 8 p.m. approximately, they found the Suburban parked on the side of Waveney Park. It had not been seen since 10.30 in the morning. Where was it? You saw school bus videos from Lapham Road. You don't see any time when that Suburban is sitting there or parked there. Now, law enforcement learned from learned about Fotis from Jennifer's friends, that he was manipulative, that he was volatile, he had a years-long custody battle going on. Michelle, yes, was in the Raptor when he dumped those garbage bags on Albany Avenue. And the police thought Michelle knew what was in them, but she didn't know. And there's no way you could see without x-ray vision what was in those bags. Incidentally, they found nothing at 80 Mountain Spring Road. There was a coffee cup that was noted in the, in the recycling bin in the garage. The one thing that might have had evidentiary value, remember what uh, Detective Pierce, Detective Sergeant Pearson said, they found nothing of evidentiary value. She noted the coffee cup, but she didn't take it. Would that not at least be consistent with what Michelle said, Fotis told her he dropped coffee, spilled coffee, and that's why he was cleaning up and he needed some paper towels. But see, that doesn't fit the, the prosecution's narrative, so they didn't even collect that 
as evidence. So Michelle was handcuffed. She was taken down to New Canaan, 80 miles away from where she was after she gets kicked out of her house. The police accused Fotis at that time of doing something that she thought was impossible. And they accused her of helping him without proof. They repeatedly said that to her. You saw she was tired. She'd been arrested in the middle of the night. She was cold. They, she had a blanket wrapped around her during the questioning. But Michelle, they told her that Michelle didn't know the real photos. They knew things about him that she did not and that he used her. They told her she needed to tell them multiple times where photos, where, where Jennifer was. They threatened her. They scared her. They lied to her all permitted under Connecticut law. They told her she was going to lose her daughter, her family, that if they found the body, she was going to get charged with accessory to murder. She kept saying she didn't know, a dozen times, maybe more. But they didn't let up. There's no evidence to suggest that Michelle, who had traveled the world, had competed nationally and internationally in sports, and wanted ever suddenly wanted to be a full-time mom to an additional five children who had just lost their mom. She had her own family. She explained that to them. She had a large and loving family. She had her good relationship with her daughter. Even the police admit in those interrogations that she was on the phone and listening. There was family discussions going on with her mom, with her sisters all while supposedly helping dispose of evidence of a murder. Michelle wasn't trying to replace anybody. She didn't want to be these children's mother. She loved these children. She liked these children. But that's a far cry from wanting to replace their mother. Yes, there was a toxic custody battle, but she thought things were working out in her favor. I'm going to talk about the timeline very briefly. You remember that Jacob Pytranker is the one who suggested to Fotis in Michelle's presence that he write a timeline. That's when she found out that he'd even been at Jennifer's house that previous Wednesday, a couple of days earlier. He, she was mad that he had lied to her about that. She was mad that, he, that she, he didn't tell her that he had been to that house. And she was angry because she thought everything was working out through the, the court process. But he was lying to her even about that. If you give any credit at all to Mr. Gumieni's revelation that Michelle made a disparaging comment about Jennifer about a month earlier, I remind you that this is a man who was given written immunity and he was given verbal immunity before that. He was a non-citizen told, told that he could be deported. There is one takeaway, however, from what he said. If you recall, what he said was that when they were bringing Wood up to the house, she was upset that her 12-year-old daughter's picture was being plastered all over the internet in connection with the disappearance of Jennifer Dulos. And what did she say, according to Mr. Gumieni? That when she shows up, I'm going to kill her. And you remember, Gumieni himself said that's what he thought, too, that she was going to show up. So. If she's already deceased, why would anybody say that? Why would Gumieni make that his response? Listen to the judge when he talks about Gumieni. There's a special instruction to be very careful before you consider the credibility of someone in his position. Both his timing and the circumstances of that statement five years later that it suddenly became a revelation should give you some hesitation here. Why? We put on Detective Allegro last week. You remember what he said, that he's the one who suggested, is it possible to, to Pavel? He said, is it possible that Fotis used that kind of language in describing his wife? This is in the July eight-hour interview, if you recall. He used those exact words, F and H, OK? Pavel said, nope, never heard of that. But that would have been the time. Ah, but I remember Michelle Tracona saying something like that. He didn't, that didn't even jog his memory about that. So I suggest to you that that part, the part about that he referred to her in derogatory terms, was made up after he got a signed 
immunity agreement to sort of ingratiate himself. Because remember, it's not just that he's been given immunity for his testimony. He's been given a get out of jail pass for anything that he may have done in connection with hiding evidence. And he knew why he was taking the seats out of his car <clears throat> at Dulos's request. Now, Michelle was overwhelmed. She was exhausted. She was in shock. She still talked to the police multiple times on June 2nd with her lawyer, on June 6th with her lawyer, and again on August 13th. She answered every one of their questions. Even when they accused her of lying, did she ever say, I'm out of here, I'm not answering any more questions? No. She kept answering their questions. It got to the point, it got to the point where whatever they said, she started agreeing with them whether it was true or not. I put one of the interview points up on the, uh, on the wall there so you can see the way it uh, played out, right? This is not just that they want her to be honest with her. They're saying there's no way he could have been home because of, through science. But we've already explained how that works with transfer of DNA, skin DNA, the, how much can easily be transferred from one person to another. And here is evidence of actual physical transfer of items barehanded between uh, Fotis, his wife, and all of his children. When she gave information, when Michelle gave information that was not within their narrative, that the puzzle pieces did not fit, they kept accusing her of lying. They told her she was wrong. They told her Fotis Doulas had to be at 69 Wells Lane. But the state hasn't been able to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that he was down there, even now. They suggest he's there. They've thrown out this, uh, this uh, darkened figure on a bicycle uh, riding along in the area. There's no connection to any of that, to the disappearance or harm that likely occurred to Jennifer Doulas. And you remember, you also will have the, for the report by, um, by Ms. Streeter, and we put it in, I, this is the part I already mentioned, she specifically described some of the things, I mean, she's talking about detail. She put every detail that she observed, that's her job, but it was about as exact, uh, line by line, minute by minute, of what happened in that house and that easily explains why a small amount of DNA would be found nowhere other than on a faucet in the kitchen. You remember uh, Kristen Medell, the uh, DNA person, because she talked about how transfer DNA, they called it touch DNA, if you remember, occurs. And I submit that that's the reason, that's the more likely reason that that's the place where the uh, DNA was found. Otherwise, what, what are we supposing here that if it was photostose, he took off his gloves, touched the faucet, and then put his gloves back on, his now maybe bloody gloves back on, walked out the door so it wouldn't be anywhere else. That's what doesn't make sense. That's what's pure speculation on the part of the uh, state. And it's also clear that photos can't be in two places at once. There's also the fact, what's, what are we going to do about getting a body or an injured woman what are they, is he going to transport her on a bicycle? Remember, where they saw the red pickup truck was about 300 yards, if I recall the testimony. It's up to you, not my memory, from where they found the Suburban. On a busy road, Lapham Road, in front of near the entrance to one of the biggest parks in this area, a public park on Memorial Day weekend on a nice day, that nobody would notice anything, that there are no other cameras from any school buses that use that route, showing any transfer, or for that matter, showing that the Suburban is even parked there. That also doesn't make sense. Where do you get the cleaning up supplies? How do you carry all these things? How do you get them from one vehicle to another outside that park on a busy, double yellow lane road? Now, there's no evidence as to when Jennifer's Suburban ended up on Lapham Road. What you do have, and I put these up, this is exhibit CC and triple C. And you'll have these documents in paper form. But there was a question raised about whether or not that Bluetooth connection of the phone belonged to Jennifer Dulos, or maybe it was the kids, maybe it was Lauren Almeida. But at this time, at 2.56 PM in the afternoon, when that Bluetooth connected to her Suburban, they were long away in New York City. 
So we know it's not them, but we have more than that. We have the Stratford police research that shows, if you look to the right there, that there were two numbers associated with Jennifer, one being uh, the, the 604 number and the other being the 499 number. And you will see that it's the, the, the number down at the bottom is that 5C number it connects to the 499 number. You see, we, there was a MAC, I think they called it, the MAC number. If you look at number two on the right, the unique number is the same as the unique number on the left there at 2.56 p.m. There's also the report, remember, by um, Mr. Newth, the forensic guy from the, uh, from the lab who talked about this as well in a letter to Detective Kimball. So they knew this all along. They just didn't pursue that at all. Incidentally, in just response to something that the prosecution said, I'm not claiming that Jennifer went through the woods and got on a train. I'm suggesting that when they followed the scent, somebody followed the scent with a dog, and it ended at the train platform at Talmadge Hill Road, the Metro North. So they didn't follow up with that. Did you hear anything, anything at all about checking the train schedule or maybe looking at you know, cameras from the trains, whether somebody ran off that way after being in the presence of Jennifer? Now, Michelle did not push back when the police told her she was wrong. She asked them what they wanted her to say, and maybe she was wrong. Even when she wasn't, even when she was helping and trying to be truthful, they told her she was wrong if that didn't fit their narrative. And eventually, for example, the, the FedEx envelope, she told them she knew nothing about these license plates. They told her, that doesn't matter. They cut her off and said, we don't need to know. That's not important. Well, it wasn't important until what? Today, when you hear the state again talk about 2024, how important that was. And they didn't even let her say what she wanted to say about that. Sometimes they were mistaken, sort of like the 30 stops when it was only three. You heard Kimball admit that was a mistake. He admitted a few times in answering questions, especially by Mr. McGinnis, those were mistakes. But the difference is those mistakes were under oath. He swore to some of these things. He couldn't remember who told him that. He didn't have any documentation. But when he swears to something under oath, if a private person does that, they'd probably get arrested and charged with perjury or false statement. For him, it's just a mistake. For Michelle, if she makes a mistake or misspeaks, it's a crime. That's the distinction that they're trying to make here. Deception, could I just have a time? 20. Deception is an interrogation tactic in Connecticut, and you heard police are allowed to, to lie, they're allowed to deceive, but they're threatening, when they're threatening a person to go to prison, maybe for many, many years, she's gonna lose her family, she's gonna lose her child. If she keeps telling them certain information, if she sticks to what she's telling them, those tactics can take a toll on memory and what you're gonna remember or say, whether it's the pressure or you've been fed enough information so it changes your perception. And I'm not gonna go into detail. You heard from my two experts, Professor Loftus and Professor Marion. One was an expert on memory and how people retrieve and repeat memory. Remember, this is nine days after May 24th. And for Michelle, it was just a mundane day. Just, she did her routine. The only exception is she told them she picked up the phone. She told them that when it was in the office. She didn't have to tell them that. Why bring that up at all? Kent Mawinney was there. You saw the video of him driving in and him driving out later. Why would she admit she's the one who picked up the phone for 16 seconds, bad connection, and she hung up? You also, and, and I want to just say one thing about uh, Professor Loftus. The prosecution suggested by naming a bunch of other cases that she was involved in that somehow She's connected to the defendants on those cases that you should tar her with the, with the people those lawyers represent, rather than that it was about science, what people remember and don't remember. You know, that has nothing to do with how you should judge the facts in this case. Same thing with, um, I would say, about Professor Marion, the linguistics ex expert. She told you about things that maybe you don't know about if you're not bilingual or multilingual. One of those things is something called influency. 
and we talk about things like, well, you listen to parts of those video, eh, eh, uh, maybe the prosecution would have you think, well, you're stalling for time. But she said that's a typical response for somebody who only has mid-level proficiency. And when you're hammering at somebody, they're under stress, you, they confuse tenses, they speak in the present when they mean to speak in the past, because in English, the present tense is the easy default. That and in the infinitive are the easiest way to speak if you're not fully 100% proficient in a second language. And things like stress and certain concepts, concepts, throwing in Spanish words in the middle of your sentence, that's all signs that you're just not proficient enough. You're just not proficient enough to handle these questions, especially when people are throwing them at you from different directions. And remember what uh, was said in a report, which you will have, authority figures, you believe, I think it was Professor Loftus that said that, if authority figure tells you something, you're more apt to believe it, that maybe you're just wrong. So maybe she was just wrong, but maybe Fotis Doulis was there. That was his phone, not her phone. And they would have to prove to you, beyond a reasonable doubt, they couldn't even be there, because that's how they've charged this. She told them about her weekend. She told them about everything she did that Friday that she could remember. And keep in mind, we'll put up the, um, we'll get to it in a minute, but she told them about the socializing the night before. She told them that uh, at, during that time, you'll remember, Fotis stepped out. He went and got steaks. And during that time, he went out to get steaks. He had a conversation on the phone with Kent Mawinney. You haven't heard a lot about Kent Mawinney, other than he's been charged with conspiracy to commit murder in this case. But he seems to be like an afterthought here. He may be the and others that you'll see are in the criminal information, conspired with Fotis Doulos and others. But there's been no evidence about her involvement with, with uh, Kent Mawinney. So I suggest you can immediately discard that as something to uh, consider in this case. But, you know, we're talking about the fact that Fotis and, and um, Pavel took the Tacoma down to 80 Mountain Spring Road the night before, right at the beginning of when Stefan Reich arrived with his wife to look at carpets and then to have dinner. But there's nothing that Michelle knew about that. She didn't know that Fotis had stopped at 80 Mountain Spring and or made a phone call to Kent Winnie when he stepped out to buy some more steaks. And she didn't know, there was nothing in fact to suggest that she knew that. On the early morning of May 24th, the thunderstorms, remember, Kimball said there were no thunderstorms we checked. He finally admitted that there were that night. And you have that map showing the red where it's all coming right down towards their house in Farmington. And that's why when her daughter called her, right, at, right before 1 a.m., she went to her room and slept in that room that night because the daughter asked her to. You have seen also surveillance cameras from Eli Road, from Jefferson Crossing and Mountain Spring Road, that between the time that Michelle went upstairs to, to her daughter's room and you see the Tacoma leave 80 Mountain Spring at 5 in the morning, there's nobody traveling on those. Or there's no pedestrians, there's no bicyclists, there's no other car, nobody, not a taxi, nobody dropping uh, somebody off. The state would have you think he must have been sneaking through people's backyards in the middle of the night. But remember, we were on top of a mountain. That's why we put in that drone uh, video. You can see it's way, way up on the top of Avon Mountain, at the pinnacle of that mountain, with views, uh, at least from their house, facing towards Harvey, you see 100 miles. The topography was why that video was shown to you. There's no evidence he was walking, running, riding a bike, or anything between the time of Thursday night and Friday morning. We do know somebody else was in New Canaan, and that was Pavel Gumieni. And you'll have that Burla report, and you'll have the pictures that show that between 12.30 p.m and 421 on the Plainville Farmington line, he's nowhere to be seen. He's disappeared. He claimed he was there all day. But first of all, you'll remember what um, Mr. Newt said. That dot on the lower left-hand side means that the, that the truck was parked behind the house. 
He had told you he always parks in the driveway, except that day. And I showed you the uh, video from across the street. You don't see any vehicle at all. But Newth testified that the truck started up at 1230 and then is not seen again till 421. Coincidentally, that's exactly in the middle of the time when the blue tooth shows up and attaches to Jennifer Dulos' Suburban at 2.56 in the afternoon. Just enough time to travel the 80 miles up from New Canaan back to the Plainville area, which is right next to Farmington. Then you see him at the gas station. They put in the receipt to show he's getting gas and how many gallons he got that day. Another point, why are we not seeing any pictures of a Raptor? They spent hours, they claim, looking for Tacomas, red trucks, Raptors. Is it, first of all, credible that there are no other red trucks that are seen on the Merritt Parkway in the entire hours that they're looking? Or did they just take a clip that said, this could be it, and we'll just put that into evidence to create a narrative that doesn't exist? No Raptors, no black Raptors at all. So how did Mr. Gumiani get, first of all, down to New Canaan or back? Where's the evidence that he didn't make a side trip? Talks about his Chinese restaurant that he went to, can't remember where it is, what he ate, or even if he was alone. We talked about the car seats. He said he replaced these car seats. There was nothing wrong with these seats. He ripped it apart, he said. And you'll notice, especially the one on the right, that's foam rubber. If there was blood, as the prosecution just suggested, wouldn't it stain foam rubber? How do you get that out? How do you get blood out of foam rubber? Remember, it was just a small amount of DNA that was found. DNA, it could have been touch DNA. And remember, she had been in that car. Jennifer had, been, had ridden in that truck before on those seats. You also have, uh, we, you also have the evidence of Pavel's um, phone. And you know that he searched during the month of May a whole bunch of other Toyota Tacomas. And he deleted all of his searches before the police got his phone. He deleted that he had been looking at uh, flights to Poland. He deleted that he was looking up about the disappearance of, the, uh, of Jennifer Dulos. And he deleted all of his search history and, mess and messages from Memorial Day weekend. Michelle didn't do any of those things. Michelle told the police, even when they insisted, when they told her that science proved that Fotis couldn't be home, that she did think he was there. She knew he had an appointment with Kent Mawinney. And sure enough, Kent Mawinney was there that morning. And she kept telling the police she thought he was there. And they told her they would walk out and charge her with accessory to murder. She continued to maintain that story. Fotis could have been there. Again, we don't represent Fotis. But he could have been there. The state must prove the contrary beyond a reasonable doubt in this case. We do know from the time that Kent Mawinney arrived just around 7.20 after Michelle left to bring her daughter to school, the timing is not a coincidence. Kent Mawinney was there for a reason that morning, but it wasn't to practice law. He's charged with conspiracy, too. But there's no evidence that he conspired with Michelle. Is he that other named co-conspirator with Fotis Dulos? There's no evidence. We don't know. And here's a different question for you to ponder. If Kent Mawinney was a co-conspirator and he was there, why not have him pick up the phone? Or better yet, if Michelle was the co-conspirator, why have Mawinney there in the first place? Why couldn't she be the one to pick up the phone. Why need Mawinney there? What was his purpose? To direct her to pick up the phone? Same thing with Andreas Tutsiartis. Remember, you were just shown a translation created by the police and the prosecutors to show you about Andreas's um, messages. They were in Greek. They were not in Greek letters. They were not in English like we were just shown. Michelle doesn't speak Greek. And so then the question becomes, what person would then send two hours later a meme that you were shown again to remind you what it was, a jokey meme, if that person believed that this was all a setup 
so that Fotis could have an alibi while murdering his wife. And it wasn't just to him, it was to two other friends as well. Again, in Greek, Greek letters, not English. <clears throat> you also know what Michelle did that day. You heard from Hutch Haynes about, about his wife, Erin, forgetting her purse at the house. Was that part of a plan, to forget her purse? You remember the state asked, well, is that when you were discussing the plan to murder Jennifer Dulos? And Mr. Uh, Haynes shockingly, well, what? But that's the way the question was asked of him, as if maybe he's part of this too. I submit there is absolutely no basis for any of that. It's as pure speculative that he had anything to do with it. The idea that his wife would leave a purse there just to create a reason for Michelle to be walking over there or driving over there the next morning to return it is as speculative as everything else that the state has presented. She had lunch with Fotis. She then went over to 80 Mountain Spring. You also have the stop and shop and going to Petu shop and all that stuff. I put this up here because you can see there was a plan by Renia Minutis, the realist her. We wanted to show the house. We want to see it on Saturday. Can we arrange it? And he goes, sure. Now, why would he agree to let a house be shown to strangers on Saturday morning early if he's using that house as a staging ground for destroying of evidence? I don't know, getting rid of clothing, getting rid of body, whatever the state is claiming is going on at 80 Mountain Spring Road. That makes no sense. It makes no sense at all. There are four trips that Michelle told the police she made going back and forth. The first time she brought the wrong kind of vacuum because it didn't have an, a central vacuuming system. So yeah, four or five minutes she goes back. She told them in, her, in, in the timeline she prepared for the lawyer, which you have, that she went back and forth. Why put that in if this is part of some nefarious scheme? Why, why list that? I realize I'm getting close to my time here, so I'm gonna to have to skip over some of this stuff. The police quizzed Michelle over and over again. These were things that it's a test she just couldn't pass. They insisted she lied. They had a big chart of what they said she had said on other occasions and then tried to trick her when, they, uh, when she said something that was different than what she had said months before. She told people that she had a fire in the fireplace. And Petu, if you remember, said she did that all the time. These are little clips from, the, from a motion-activated camera, and that's what you see. What was she burning in that fireplace? Firewood. Just like Gumieni said when he helped her bring wood up to the house. You also, if you looked at those videos, see how windy it is. It was very, very windy. Those trees are blowing all over the place, and you're on top of the mountain. So it is not unreasonable, even in May, to have a fire going in your fireplace. Now, if you go to the garbage bags on Albany Avenue and you look at those, you also can speculate. What, what could not have been burned? You could burn garbage bags. You can burn ponchos. You can burn cloth. You can even burn sponges. Why not do that? Those are the items that would be, quote, incriminating. Police had that house for Jefferson seized for over a week, that the evidence shows, and they found nothing. They went in there with cadaver dogs, other canines. They found no trace of any evidence that connected that house to, to uh, the disappearance of, of, of um, Jennifer Dulos. Briefly, I'm just going to mention a few other items since I'm running out of time. There's the Tacoma key issue that was brought up. The key was lit, sticking out of the side of the truck when everyone was leaving. And as soon as Fotis called her to bring it back, she brought it back to suggest, as the police have, that there was something nefarious or evil about it. Why didn't she just say she didn't have the key? Why not uh, not come back in the seven minutes that she came back? When it comes to the issue of the gum, and I'm going to end with that and with one other thing. I'm going to end, actually, there's the gum. You will see that she's wiping her hands. She's not picking something up. So when the police told that 
to Colangelo, they were giving him false information. And I just want to play, that's going to be the last thing, I'm going to play that clip from the, um, from Colangelo. So we are, looks like we're at 220. I don't know if it's very close, but I just don't mention, I 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 don't mention, if I was going to dump, if I was going to go around the city of Richie Clay Hooks, one in one mission, dump all of our trash over the city, I would have done that once It would have just slipped my mind. We would do more than that. We have it. And then save the trash over the city. Unless she's legitimately on the phone, talking and texting, and she's not paying attention. Right. And then she went outside the car, get on it, she told the baby she was. Yeah. She was outside? She was opening her clothes open, and she got outside and showed the problem. Her story was that she dropped gum and she realized it was sticky and she had a short girl came back. I thought the girl when she dropped. She's like, I was one person in the world that I was One person in the world that picks up gum. One person in the world that picks up gum. She never said that she picked up gum. Here's the state's attorney, the chief law enforcement officer for this judicial district saying she doesn't know. Maybe she doesn't know and you've got the three detectives telling him something that's false to get him to come off the notion that she doesn't go. And I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, if he thought she didn't know, then that's reasonable doubt right there. This trial is a tragedy, no question about it. It is a tragedy for many people, including people that are sitting here in this uh, audience, in this courtroom right now. But this case here is not about sympathy, and it's not about antipathy and revenge. There is only speculation and no facts. We are all sitting here in hindsight, deciding what happened after the fact, what one should have known versus did know. What we can do when Michelle, for example, Calvin, picked you've up, got one minute. Thank you. When Michelle picked up Fotis from the car wash, she didn't go in there. She had nothing to do with what Fotis Doulas planned to do with that vehicle on that occasion. Now, I don't get another opportunity. You may to speak. You may think that the state has a second bite of the apple. That's not fair, but it's important for you to understand the reason for this is they have the burden of proof on everything. We don't. So they do get to speak last, but I want you just to remember that they have a burden of proving beyond a reasonable doubt for each element of each of the crimes the judge is going to read to you. And I ask that you reach the correct verdict, which is not guilty. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning. Before you proceed, Attorney McGinnis, uh, the jury would like a brief break. Yes, sir. Uh, we will continue with the closing arguments at 12 noon. All right.
All rise. This Honorable Superior Court is now open and back in session. Good morning, Your Honor. Please be seated. <clears throat> Bring the jury in, please. Council stipulate, please. Yes, Judge. Yes, Your Honor. Attorney McGinnis. Uh, last night when I was thinking about what I was going to say to you this morning, it occurred to me what this case is really about. It is about a mother's worst nightmare. It is about a mother being taken away from her children in life or in death. It is about Petros, Theodore, Christiane, Constantine, and Noel, who went to bed on May 24th not knowing where their mother was, and she has still not arrived. That's what this case is about. And so the question becomes, who is responsible for Jennifer Dulos's death? Now, the defense in their closing argument suggested a couple of different things to you. On the one hand, they said it's likely that she's dead, thus leaving the possibility open that she's still alive. Do any of you really believe that? The other possibility is that Fotis Dulos is this monstrous murderer. And still a third possibility that Fotis Dulos wasn't responsible, but Jennifer Dulos is dead nonetheless. But what you didn't hear a lot about in the closing argument from the defense was about Hartford Run and the dump of the evidence. You didn't hear much about that. Very tangentially, they addressed it. I pose this question to you. Do any of you doubt that Fotis Dulos is responsible for the death of his wife? Do any of you doubt that he was in New Canaan on May 24th, 2019, murdering his wife? How else would he have had her bloody bra, her bloody shirt, blood all over the bags, his DNA in a glove found inside the trash? How? And so when the defense suggests that to you, I suggest that's not reasonable. And so once you conclude that Mr. Dulos is responsible for the death of his wife, you then go to the next questions, which are, is this defendant legally responsible for her death? Is this defendant legally responsible for conspiring to tamper with evidence, for acting as an accessory to tamper with evidence? Was the defendant motivated to harm Jennifer Dulos? I want you to make no mistake about this. This defendant hated Jennifer Dulos. She referred to her as a bitch who should be buried next to the dog. Now, I'm just gonna say this because we're gonna talk about Mr. Humiani in a few moments. The defense is trying to have it both ways. Disbelieve Mr. Gumiani about that, but believe him about the remark the following week. We'll talk about that. She had animus towards Jennifer Dulos. Even in her interviews, you heard it, and by the way, you're gonna have the interviews, so you don't have to take my word for it. She referred to Jennifer Dulos as a manipulator. She said, you people are toxic, referring to Fotis Dulos and Jennifer Dulos. She said that since she moved to Connecticut, it had been two years of torture. She even admitted, if you caught it, 
that she demanded that Fotis Dulos go to therapy with her because of Jennifer Dulos. Everything was not okay. And when the defense gets up here and they say to you, well, the report, everything was going so well, there was no motive, Fotis didn't have a motive, Michelle didn't have a motive, think about what she actually said about that report for a second. Jennifer is trying to manipulate you, Fotis. Stick with the courts. She has borderline personality disorder. So even after the report came out, this defendant didn't buy it. This defendant didn't think everything was going to be OK. This defendant needed to go to therapy to see how Jennifer Dulos being in her life was going to impact her future. And so when they say that there was no motive, when they say that there's no evidence that Michelle motivated to commit this crime, I submit to you that is completely contrary to the evidence. And I also just want to say this, and I don't quite know where this fits in. That's for you guys as the fact finders to decide. There's something unsettling about the defendant and Mr. Dulos fooling around on the passenger side of that Tacoma on May 24th, 2019. And you'll recall that from the third interview. And where that fits into all this, I'm going to leave it up to you to decide. The defendant in this case repeatedly lied to investigators. Repeatedly lied to investigators. What does that say about her culpability? What does that say about what she knew in advance? What does that say about what she knew was going to happen to Jennifer Dulos and what she knew they did after the fact? So let's run through some of the things the defendant said to investigators. I showered with Fotis Dulos on May 24, 2019. I, 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 I,
as the investigators get more evidence and she sits down for a third and final interview. Now all of a sudden she didn't see him. Wait, I actually did see his phone. And incidentally, I just happened to answer the one phone call that he had in his timeline, the phone call that he set up the night before. Now, I am just going to say this. Her lies were so profound that the defense brought in two experts to try to explain them away to you. And what I suggest to you about those experts is number one, Dr. Loftus couldn't point to a single thing, not one thing, in this record that the police officers fed her. Not one. So when the defense attorney gets up and says, you'll see in the report authority figures, I asked her on cross-examination, did the officer suggest that? I don't recall. Did the officer suggest that? No. Not one thing. And it's interesting, too. We talk about language proficiency. We talk about why she may have said the things that she said. I'm going to tell you exactly why, members of the jury, you should reject that. If that's really the case, she has memory lapses, she has false implanted memories, she doesn't speak the language. If that's really what's going on, why is she so good on details that don't matter? And so bad on details that incriminate her? Why? How does she know she bought parsley at Stop and Shop? She even told the police, if you'll recall and you watched the interview, that when she went up to Starbucks, she tried to order a chocolate croissant and they were out. That's the kind of detail that she provided. And yet when it comes to things that incriminate her, language gap, memory gap, you exercise your common sense. You're smart people. You get it. This is not reasonable. Here's the thing about the lies also. She doubled down on it, didn't she? When Detective Clabby told her during that first interview that Fotis Doulos had murdered his wife, after that, she went back to, I saw him in the house. She doubled down on these lies. In her second interview, she said she never read Fotis Doulos' timeline. That's interesting, isn't it? Because his timeline, you'll recall, notes the call from Greece, notes the call from Andreas because it was designed to be an alibi for him, just like she was. And as you know, that phone call was arranged the night before. This defendant was undoubtedly part of this plan to kill Jennifer Dulos. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. The cops asked her, why wasn't Hartford in your timeline? Oh, I was going to write that, but I got interrupted. Isn't that a coincidence? Isn't that convenient? Speaking of that, you heard the defense talk about Kent Mawinney. The evidence is, is that when that phone call came in, what did Kent Mawinney say to the defendant in her own words? Does anyone remember? Is this the call? The call. Isn't that strange? Freudian slip. You only have to find that the defendant conspired with one other person to find her guilty of conspiracy to commit murder. And it's obvious here that she conspired with Mr. Dulos. She was part of his alibi while he was in New Canaan and murdering his wife. In the second interview, she told investigators that Mr. Dulos hadn't told her what to write in her timeline. But by the time we get to the third interview, he told her. So you think about that. Why is someone who is innocent lying so much? That's a question for you to answer. Now, I want you to also think about 80 Mountain Spring Road and the timing of everything. Why would Mr. Dulos, and again, the evidence is overwhelming that he murdered his wife. So why would Mr. Dulos invite her to 80 Mountain Spring Road to clean the house while he's cleaning the Tacoma that you know was involved in this crime, unless she was involved. Why would she bring cleaning supplies? Think about it for one second. 
I want you to just think about that. Photos to Wilson's head. While I clean blood out of a Tacoma from my estranged wife's death, can you clean the house? Is that reasonable? To say nothing of the fact that she completely omitted the Tacoma from her first two interviews. Why was that? Why wasn't the Tacoma mentioned? Why wasn't that brown stained paper towel mentioned during the first two interviews? Also, think about how the defendant described going to 80 Mountain Spring Road. She says that initially, Fotis Dulos called her to bring cleaning supplies. She kind of is, is distancing herself from what was going on down there. But you know that they actually went together. And it's not until she's pressed that she admits that they went together. And it's corroborated by the surveillance footage. <laughs> A green team some guys mm -hmm. a, for to clean the house. Okay. For Randy. Okay. That's more or less what I remember. And he called me like at 1 50 something. Mm -hmm. Then he calls me like at 3. A, well, let me just tell you that at 1 33, Fotis is driving to Jefferson, or uh, driving to Mount Spring. And by 136, you guys are both arriving in the announcement. Okay, so I went with the cleaning stuff. Okay, but you went with him. You guys are both driving into the driveway together, together, like literally right one right behind the other. went together? So you say, well, Attorney McGinnis, that was just an innocent memory lapse, no harm, no foul. Put a pin in that. We're going to come back to that. Why would the defendant go to 80 Mountain when you know that this cleanup is going on? Think about what the defendant brought to 80 Mountain and what was later found in the trash. Go. So it got cut off, but they were asking her what the color of the sponge was. And she said yellow and green. What color sponge was found in the trash in Hartford with Jennifer Dulos's blood and DNA on it? What type of bags were found in Hartford with Jennifer Dulos's blood and DNA in them? With Jennifer Dulos's bloody bra and shirt in them? Think about the fires. Three separate fires on the afternoon of May 24th, 2019. None of those made the timeline. Just like Hartford didn't make the timeline. Just like the Keys didn't make the timeline. Who's lighting a fire on Memorial Day weekend? Better question. Who's lighting three fires on the Friday before Memorial Day weekend on a day like that? The fact is, is that she lit three separate fires at a time, and you know with certainty that the cleanup of Jennifer Dulos's murder is going on. And the phone data shows that she was at the house by herself. Her admissions show that she was at the house by herself lighting those fires. The surveillance shows her going back and forth repeatedly. Five minutes at a time, nine minutes at a time, fire, fire. She's not involved. Pavel Gumian, one person ran towards the Tacoma, embraced it, and another one avoided the Tacoma. And you guys will recall that image that the defense admitted into evidence where Pavel Gumian is at the police department with oil looking to get his vehicle back. Does that sound like somebody that was involved in this murder? Everything that Mr. Gumieni said to you was corroborated by video surveillance, the infotainment system, the gas receipt. There's even surveillance footage of him leaving with the dirt bike in the back of his vehicle. You guys will recall that. You'll remember that there was only one exhibit, I believe, during the trial that I actually physically handed you, and it was the surveillance shot because it was difficult to see with the plank in the back. You guys will recall that. 
Everything he said was corroborated by the surveillance footage. Everything. And by the way, if you're going to have the temerity in closing argument to accuse someone of being involved in a murder, at least have the brass to ask them when they're here on cross-examination. Objection, Your Honor. Well, at this point, the court can appreciate Fellas' argument, but ad hominem attacks should not be considered by the jury, neither should they continue. Mr. Gumiani withstood an entire day of cross-examination, an entire day of cross-examination, and he stood up to it. He even told you little details like he had sold his motorbike to the defendant. She lied about that too, didn't she? She lies about big details and small details. And of course, he told you how the defendant took his keys. Now, up until the third interview, she didn't even admit that, that vehicle was at Green Mountain Spring Road. And even she admitted that taking those keys looked bad, didn't she? So this is where the problem is. This is where it's problematic. This is where we come back to, to this. All the things that we talked about in here that were said by you, not once, sometimes twice, as we met two times before, that, but I said, were, that were less than truthful. Now all of a sudden, you're taking the keys. You have to understand how that looks, okay? It looks very bad. Why did she avoid bringing up the Tacoma in her first two interviews? Why did she not tell investigators that Mr. Julius was cleaning the Tacoma? And then, of course, there's the coffee-stained paper towel that she doesn't mention until the final and third interview that she threw out in the trash herself. Think about all those trips back and forth, all the calls back and forth. Not only is his vehicle there, his being Mr. Gumiani's, but the defendant admitted it looked bad that she took his keys. Why would she take his keys unless she's trying to keep that vehicle there? Russell Speeder's car wash. Remember I told you to put a pin in that lie earlier about going to 80 Mountain Spring Road? She tried to pull the same lie about Russell Speeder's car wash. She initially said that Mr. Dulos called her to pick him up and then later had to admit, actually, we went in tandem. And then, of course, they say, are you sure you didn't go at the same time? Oh, maybe we actually did go at the same time. Members of the jury, that truck was clean. 18-year-old work truck, no profiles on the door. They destroyed the evidence, and she helped him. She picked him up. Her phone number was used. That's hindering. That's accessory to tampering with evidence. I want to just talk to you now, because the evidence in this case has proven the defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. I want to just pose these questions to you as you head into your deliberations. Is it really just a bunch of coincidences? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant answered Dulos' phone at Fort Jefferson Crossing when he was murdering his wife in New Canaan? Is it just a coincidence that Dulos' phone is being moved and manipulated when, the, when only the defendant is home? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant brought cleaning supplies to 80 Mountain Spring Road where you know the cleanup of the Tacoma was going on? Is it just a coincidence that the call from Greece is not in the defendant's timeline? Is it just a coincidence that during the cleanup, only hours after Jennifer is murdered, the defendant is shuttling back and forth between Fort Jefferson and 80 Mountain Spring Road? Is it just a coincidence during these trips back and forth, the defendant starts a fire at Fort Jefferson Crossing? Is it just a coincidence that during these trips back and forth, the defendant starts a second fire at Fort Jefferson Crossing? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant eventually lights a third fire at Fort Jefferson Crossing? 
Is it just a coincidence that while Dulos is cleaning the Tacoma, she takes a brown stained paper towel from him and throws it in the trash? Is it just a coincidence that despite no one telling her to, she took the keys to the Tacoma? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant travels with Dulos to Hartford as he disposes of the evidence on the same day? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant brought black garbage bags to 80 Mountain and Jennifer's shirt and bra were found inside black trash bags? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant brought a green and yellow sponge to 80 Mountain Spring Road and two of those were found in the trash in Hartford? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant brought a broom and the police found a mop or a broom handle in the trash at Albany Avenue in Hartford? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant opened the door to the Raptor at the exact moment that Dulos exits the vehicle to dump those license plates in the sewer and block that other vehicle's view? Is it just a coincidence that despite her daughter not being home, the defendant panicked when the police came to the house, went to three separate rooms and said, I don't want to be here? By the way, if the police come to someone's door while their child is not home, would you expect a reasonable person to immediately go to the door and make sure the child is okay? Unless, of course, that person just knowingly committed a crime. Is it just a coincidence that the defendant followed Fotis Dulos to the car wash and then tried to lie about it? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant's phone number and not Dulos's number was used at the car wash? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant lied and said she showered with Dulos when he was actually en route to murder his wife? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant lied about seeing Dulos in the office again while he was in New Canaan murdering his wife? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant initially denied seeing Dulos' phone on the morning that Jennifer was murdered? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant said she saw Dulos meeting with Kent Mawinney at Fort Jefferson Crossing around the time of Jennifer's murder, the same information that was in Dulos' timeline? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant never mentioned starting a fire to the police until they confronted her in the third and final interview? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant failed to mention that the Tacoma was at 80 Mountain Spring Road during her first two interviews? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant never mentioned that Dulos had washed the Tacoma during her first two interviews? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant answered the one call mentioned in Dulos' timeline on that morning? as having been answered by him on the morning of his wife's murder? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant failed to tell police that Fotis Dulles' bicycle was at 80 Mountain Spring Road until the third and final interview? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant lied about not going back to 80 Mountain Spring Road to return those keys? Is it just a coincidence that Dulos told the Bell Committee to keep the defendant, quote, out of this when the committee brought up the defendant taking his keys? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant's DNA was found on the opening of a garbage bag that also contained blood stains, tape, and Jennifer Dulos's DNA? Are all these things just coincidences? Or is the defendant guilty? Now, during voir dire, we asked each of you, if the state proved its case beyond a reasonable doubt, would you be able to come out here and find the defendant guilty in open court? And each of you promised us that you could. We've done that. We've met our burden of proof in this case. Now, I want to show you, and I have two minutes left here, the timelines. One last time, we're going to talk about these timelines. Now, Fotis's is to the left, the defendant's timelines are to the right. And they have been referred to as timelines, but they were really just a script, weren't they? And maybe some of you remember from English class in high school, every script has three acts, doesn't it? The first act was the premeditation and killing of Jennifer Dulos. The second act was the cover-up through the destruction of evidence and the defendant's lies. And now we've reached the third act, except she doesn't get to write it. You do. You write the third act of this script with your verdict. What's the ending going to be? Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, you have heard the 
closing arguments in the matter of State of Connecticut versus Michelle Traconis. The court will instruct you on the law, but the court will do that after the lunch and recess. That instruction will take about 50 minutes. Because the instruction will take that much time, what the court has decided to do is give each one of you a complete copy of the instruction so that you can follow along. Otherwise, it would be difficult to digest those instructions as the court is reading it and you are trying to listen. We will stand in our lunch and recess. Please do not discuss the case. Please do not talk to anyone about the case. And we plan to see you at 2 o'clock. All rise. This honorable.